Hey everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. My name is Todd Rothman, and in this video, we're gonna go over stereochemistry. Stereochemistry is a chapter that's really important for the whole year because it's about the three-dimensional perspective of a molecule, and that's something that we're gonna use throughout the whole year. So it's important that we really take the time now and make sure that we get this down because it's, again, not just going to come up for this exam, but you're going to see this on the final of Organic Chemistry 2. You're going to have to know this information. The good news is, as with pr pretty much everything in Organic Chem, it gets easier after you practice a little bit, but at first you're going to have a little bit of a struggle possibly because it's a lot of new concepts. But don't worry, by the time we're finished with this video for this chapter series, we're going to wind up really knowing it well, and it's something that you'll have for not just organic chem, but if you're taking the MCAT or the DATs or whatever you need in the future, you'll always have it available. All right, I'm going to show you some tr uh, tricks and tips and make it as easy as possible for you to learn this material. Let's get started. So the first thing is now just an introduction, and it all begins with the idea that an isomer must exist between molecules in order to consider stereoisomerism. So let's refresh our memory. What is an isomer? An isomer is when you have molecules that have the exact same formula. They have the same number of atoms, the same type of atoms, but they're different. They're not the same. So there are two types of isomers. There's constitutional isomers, which is where we have a connectivity difference. We talked about this back in chapter two for exam one. We talked about connectivity differences. So remember, like for example, if I have, let's say, butyl alcohol, and then I look at, let's say, diethyl ether, they have the exact same molecular formula, C4H10O. So they're the same with respect to the formula, but they're very different with respect to structure, right? So this oxygen here is connected to a carbon and an H. That's not the same thing as an oxygen that has two carbons. So not only do they have different connections, they have different functional groups, they have different properties, different boiling points, different melting points, they have different solubility, they have different reactivity. So there's a lot of differences between them. The only thing that they share in common is the same formula. That's it. So these are isomers. These are constitutional isomers. They're connection differences. Now, there's other isomers, like, for example, I could have four carbons and the OH in the middle like that. So this is very similar to this one, but it's still constitutional difference because here this is on the end and here this OH is in the middle somewhere. So these are constitutional isomers as well. Okay, so the idea of constitutional is where there's a connection difference. But remember, they have to have the same formula. All right, now stereoisomer is what we're going to learn about for the next five or six hours. And what this is about is this is about spatial differences. So they have the same formula, but they, they also have the same connectivity. They have a difference in arrangement in space. There are three types that we can think of. The first one, actually, I'm not a big fan of this idea, but it is true under certain conditions. But conformations could be considered isomers. I'll explain to you why and when. First off, conformations is something that we talked about in the previous chapter, the last chapter. So it's these snapshots in time that a molecule can be uh, in spatial arrangement. So for example, here are two drawings of a molecule looking at it from the head-on point of view. Remember, this is the Newman projection. We're looking straight on. Now notice that this A and this B, they're separate because they're on the same carbon, but behind it is C. And this C can either be next to B, or if I was to just simply grab C, I can rotate clockwise, almost like turning like a steering wheel, turn it around so that it spins around and all of a sudden it's in between A and B. See that? So all I did is I grab this and I turn it clockwise as if I was turning a steering wheel from the back, the back carbon or the back bond, and bring it in between A and B, and I get to that right there. See that? Okay, so now this is a different drawing on paper, but it turns out that in real life, these two are not different in the sense that they're the same molecule because in real life, there's energy that allows for rotation. 
It's called the barrier of rotation. There's a certain amount of energy required to do that. But imagine if I had freezing conditions. Well, meaning I have temperatures so low that there's no energy to rotate. Then these two are not the same anymore. They have the same connections. They have the same formula. But they're not the same, right? They have a difference in spatial arrangement. So conformations under freezing conditions, under very low temperature conditions, are stuck in time as they are laid out. And that makes them different. So now these two are not the same. They're actually different molecules under freezing conditions. Okay, so that's an example of a stereoisomerism. But there's two more types. There's something known as enantiomers and diastereomers, and that's really what most, I should say all, of this chapter is about. We're not really going to talk about conformations anymore. So we, we do this just to kind of be complete. We learned this idea back in the previous chapter, but now let's focus in. So this is all about these two right here. Um, chapter 5 is all about enantiomers and diastereomers. So let's talk about that. So the first thing I want to talk about is a property known as chirality. Now, I want this to be clear for you. What do I, what do I mean by property? Okay, because it's really important that we get this fact straight now so that it doesn't confuse us later. Chirality is a property of a molecule just the same way that your eye color is a property of you. The shape of your lips is a property of you. The fact that you have dimples or not is a property of you. Your, your color of your skin, the property of you. These are properties of you, right? Well, chirality is a property of a molecule. Some molecules have chirality, and we say that they're chiral. Other molecules don't have chirality, just like sometimes people don't have uh, freckles, right? Some people have freckles and some people don't. So achiral means it does not have chirality. So chirality is a property, and either you have it or you don't. So what is chirality? Well, it's basically an idea that a molecule can have a mirror image representation of itself, something that looks just like itself in a mirror, but yet it is not the same thing. They're not the same. Okay, that's what it means to have chirality, the property of chirality. It means that a molecule somewhere in the world has another reflection of itself, a molecule that looks just like it, but they're not the same as each other. Okay, all right, that's chirality. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is when you have chirality. And we can discuss chirality from the point of view of molecules, but I first want to do it from a macroscopic point of view. Okay, so another thing that we say about chirality, we call it handedness. And let's think about that term, handedness. Why is it called handedness? Well, it all comes down to even thinking about our hand. So here's a macroscopic example. Okay, and I'm going to show you a few right now because I want you to understand that this idea of chirality is not just for molecules. It's actually in objects in our world as well, in our macroscopic world. Here's a hand. Now, it's not a great drawing, but I tried my best to do it before I started recording. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to clone this. And now I'm going to drag the hand and put it in this mirror. Okay? Now, imagine if I was to take my left hand, which is this one here, and I put it in front of a mirror, then it would see the right hand. See, this hand sees that hand. So in the mirror, my left hand would see the right hand. So look at that for yourself. Take your hands and make sure that the thumbs are in the same direction and put them right in front of each other. And look closely. You'll notice that it matches up. So when you take your left hand and put it in front of your right hand, they match up like that. You could see that everything matches up. So your left and right hand have mirror image capabilities. Now, are they chiral? Well, we don't know yet because so far we know that they're mirror images. How do I prove that they're chiral? Here's what you do. I want you to take your left and right hand and have it so that both palms are pointing straight up into the air. Okay? So have it with your palms. Make your hands flat, straight, you know, straight, and put it as if you're kind of praying. You're putting your hands right in front of you, and both palms are pointing straight up. Now, without making your palms touch each other, try to drop one hand on top of the other. 